Welcome to our fifth Brown Grotta Art Zoom exhibition and our third episode of Art on the Rocks, an exhibition walkthrough with spirits. I'm Rhonda Brown, and for 30 plus years, my husband Tom Grotta and I have been promoting the work of dozens of international contemporary artists. We've chosen a few dozen images of international contemporary art from our recent exhibition, Acclaim, work by award-winning international artists. We'll speak about each no longer than one minute. We hope this provides a dynamic way to explore Brown Grotta arts, exhibitions, and artists online. We're adding spirits in our curated cocktail recipe, carefully paired to extend the aesthetic experience. In this episode of Art on the Rocks, we'll talk through some of the works and themes in Acclaim, our spring 2023 exhibition, and introduce a drink, a Golden French 75, created in celebration of Acclaim. The exhibition featured 51 artists from 14 countries. If you want to see even more artwork, there is a catalog you can order from our website. You can find all the artworks from Acclaim on Artsy through June 30th. Now to our curated cocktail. Our French Golden, our Golden French 75 was researched by our talented in-house mixologist, Max Fanwick. You can learn more about Max's libations and culinary creations at, at run, cook, sleep, repeat. Here's a visual how-to. Directions are simple. Now to the talk through. In the last decade at Brown Grotta Arts, we've seen greater appreciation for fiber art as the craft art divide has eroded. As a result of that change, we've seen the resale market for fiber art grow significantly. That's a welcome development that provided us an opportunity to educate and excite new audiences for this work. We found and placed important works at auction in the last 10 years, including Translucence by Leah Cook from 1978, this rare monofilament by Kei Sekimachi from the 1970s that went to the Fine Art Museum in Houston. This weaving by Lenore Tawney, Waterfall from 1975. And this vessel by Fern Jacobs, Streak from 1998. By late 2022, we found ourselves working to place works from eight different estates, including work from the estates of Dorothy Gale Barnes, Mary Giles and Glenn Kaufman, and choice pieces being deaccessioned by collectors in Connecticut, New Jersey, Illinois, California, and Florida, including from Bob Fanabaker's extraordinary collection housed in four buildings he built in Pennsylvania. We realized that for the most part, the works we were compiling were made by a celebrated group of artists. Many were members of the College of Fellows of the American Craft Council, like Adela Akers, who created Windows in 1998. 11 of the artists whose work was available for resale were winners of the American Craft Council Gold Medal, including John McQueen, who created Arm & Hammer in 2006, the figure from Twigs and the snake on which he stands from plastic Arm & Hammer laundry detergent bottles. Also, gold medalist Cynthia Shira, who created these detailed weavings, Spring Lyric and Nightfall in 1979. Other artists in this group had been awarded Masters of the Medium from the James Renwick Alliance for Craft, including Norma Minkowitz, who created Sophie's Heart in 2002, and the late Mary Giles, who created Copper Divide in 2013. All told, 14 of the artists in acclaim have received Renwick Alliance Masters of the Medium, Distinguished Artist, or Distinguished Educator Awards. Two of the artists in the exhibition are fellows of the Textile Society of America, Sheila Hicks and also Ann Wilson, whose 1997 work of hair and thread embroidery you see here. One of the artists whose work we received in resale could even claim an order of the British Empire. 
Peter Collingwood's technical and aesthetic innovations, including his macro gauze weavings, and on the right, experiments with shaft switching and angled wefts are appreciated worldwide. He is collected by other artists, which tells you a great deal about his mastery. The macro gauze is from Glenn Kaufman's personal collection. You can find online an interview with Kei Sekimachi for Craft in America, in which she talks about her personal collection of works by Collingwood and Cynthia Shira. In addition to the artists shared with us in resale, Brown Grotta Arts promotes many other award-winning artists. Ulamaya Vickman of Finland, for example, has been chosen Texo Artist of the Year in Scandinavia, and now is the first recipient of a Texo Lifetime Achievement Award, shown here, a work of hand-painted threads by Vickman, Shivering from 2002. Hiro Yanazawa of Japan had received the prestigious Kotsen Bamboo Prize. He created this work of bamboo in 2023. Simone Philpin received the City of Paris Grand Prize, and on and on. We decided to lean in to the award-winning theme, explore these honors and accolades, and celebrate award-winning artists and artworks in the Acclaim exhibition and catalog. Acclaim would have to include pioneers in the field of contemporary craft, of course, like American Craft Council College of Fellows member and Women in Design International honoree, Francois Grasson, whose work of buff pads from 1980 you see here. ACC gold medalist Lenore Tawney would be included, of course. We would show a small gift she had made in 1990, which we called Gift Pipe, and Book of Foot, a whimsical assemblage from 1996. Another American Craft Council gold medalist, Kay Sekimachi, will be represented by an unthinkably delicate leaf bowl and a blue paper and thread bowl from 1990 from Dorothy Gail Barnes' personal collection. Gail Barnes has received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Basketry Organization. To round out our veritable who's who of contemporary fiber, we asked Sheila Hicks, another gold medalist, a Lifetime Achievement in Contemporary Sculpture Award winner, and a French Legion of Honor member to participate. In this work, Aracaria from 2015, Hicks has incorporated material from a South American conifer. After our exhibition list was completed, we reached out to several artists and asked them how achieving various honors had affected them and their careers. For some artists, these artists' awards come later in a career and represent the acknowledgement of a lifetime of hard work, perseverance, and success. For a few lucky others, though, like Laura Foster Nicholson, who received the 1985 Leonie Di Pietro Prize at the Venice Biennale of Architecture three years after graduating from the Cranbrook Academy of Arts, awards become the springboard to a lifelong future of creative practice. This work, Maze, is from that significant period in her career. Helena Hernmark's Craftsmanship Medal from the American Institute of Architects, which she received in 1973 at age 32, also influenced the direction of her career. The AIA medal was a fantastic honor, she says. Her large-scale tapestries had been featured in a solo exhibition at the Museum of Honor and Art, and a solo exhibition in Los Angeles was in preparation. But this award was for an architectural commission at Weyerhaeuser in Tacoma, Washington. It depicted the rainforest, nine feet tall, 14 feet wide. It met recognition in the cohort that I was very focused on working with, namely architects. So it was hugely helpful. It cemented the idea that I would be doing tapestries for corporate lobbies designed by architects. Hernmark's corporate and public commissions are widely known, but the series in Acclaim represents something new, smaller, intimate works created on a handloom that incorporate letters that her mother wrote her from Sweden after she had left for the UK, Canada, and eventually the US. Recognition can offer validation for a new direction in an artist's work. Greta Sorensen, won the Nordic Textile Award in 2017, the finest recognition within textile art in the Nordics. Such recognition boosts your work. It gives renewed energy, desire, and the opportunity to work on new investigations, experiments, and projects, Sorensen told us. The award encouraged her to continue her experiments in digitally controlled weaving with exciting results like these recent works that examine stitches in an almost microscopic fashion. For Anique Klein, Formal recognition solidified the choice of subjects she pursues in her art. 
She views awards like the first prize she won at the Textile Art of Today competition in Eastern Europe last year as a tangible commitment to my research and depiction of the social themes I would like to highlight. The award increased her confidence in the language she wants to speak with her work. Klein says, my vocabulary is growing as a result. Not to be underestimated is the aff affirmation such awards can provide for an artist's mid-career. There are no other large prizes in the UK for artists working in the medium, says Joe Barker of the Cordes Prize for Tapestry that she won in 2016. What winning felt like mostly to me, she wrote, was a validation of the career that I'd had so far. Awards can enhance the standing of not just artists, but also the medium. When she was selected as Artist of the Year by the National Museum of Contemporary Art in Seoul, Korea in 2008, for example, Yoon Soon Chang saw her textile work in the broader scope of contemporary art. Objective recognition gave me courage to work and a sense of responsibility, she says. Winning Best Visual Arts Exhibition of the Year from the Circle of Critics of Art in Chile in 2013 was a recognition of 40 years of work for Caroline Razaval and a confirmation for all those who believed in her work, clients, galleries, and museums. However, she says, I must emphasize the importance of the fact that textile art was awarded for the first time in Chile, placing it on par with all disciplines in visual arts. Therefore, it is not only a recognition of my personal contribution, but also to this discipline, which for a long time was seen as a minor art. Double joy for the contribution made to textile art in my country. Yorazabal's experience of working in what has felt like an underappreciated medium was shared by many of the artists in Acclaim. Carolyn Kipp, who wrote the essay for the Acclaim catalog, made several insightful observations about what keeps artists pursuing the arts when recognition is not one of the awards. Kip, who is the former curator of contemporary art at the George Washington Textile Museum in Washington, DC, and currently a PhD student in history at the University of Maryland, highlights two motivations, a sense of community and a sense of play. Academic communities are one example Kip points to. While not unique to fibers or craft, Kip notes, this sense of community is particularly strong within this field. Ongoing supportive relationships can be traced to the acclaimed artists through their pioneering roles. The Cranbrook Academy of Arts may be first and foremost among this group. Gerhard Nodell was artist in residence and head of the fiber department at Cranbrook from 1970 to 1995 when these works were made and directed the Academy from 1995 to 2007. He now holds the title of Director Emeritus. After serving in the Air Force, Glenn Kaufman received an MFA from Cranbrook, then returned to head the fiber departments at Cranbrook until 1967. After that, he taught at the University of Georgia for 40 years. For much of that time, he spent half his time in Japan, where he created works like Roof Tile Grid, which involved photo images of Japanese roofs silk screened onto fabric. Both he and Nodell received a Master of the Medium Educator Awards from the James Renwick Alliance, as well as recognition from the American Craft Council. USA fellow Warren Selig, who created both this weaving in 1972 and these complex spoke and wheel works in 1996, received an MFA from Cranbrook. Ed Rosbach did too, and so did Laura Foster Nicholson. Olga Diamorel, lifetime award winner from the New York Caucus of Women's Art, credits her time at Cranbrook Academy of Art as forming the foundation of her lifetime career. She had already studied architectural drafting and design in Bogota, Colombia, before pursuing a one-year weaving program under Marion Strangle, head of weaving at Cranbrook, where she worked on a loom for the first time. While at Cranbrook, she also met her husband, Jim Amaral, also a prolific artist and designer. When returning to Colombia, Amaral took with her a loom from the weaving studio, which traveled by boat, and according to a recent story in Vogue, it is still present in her studio and known as the Cranbrook Loom. Last year, Cranbrook awarded her an honorary MFA. This early work by Amaral is a resale from a gallerist who represented the artist in the East Coast in the mid-1970s. After finishing his MFA at Cranbrook, Ed Rosbach formed a noted fiber community at the University of California, Berkeley, where he taught textile design for 29 years. Rosbach mastered traditional techniques, then experimented with unconventional meat materials like this weaving of plastic from 1970. 
Rosbach encouraged students like gold medalist Leah Cook and NBO Lifetime Achievement Award winner Ginge Lockie to follow his experimental approach. After graduation, Lockie started the FiberWorks program in Berkeley, another community devoted to educational and international exchange, hosting Sheila Hicks and Magdalena Abakanowitz, among others. Lockie is known for her deft combining of natural and man-made materials, as you can see in Invitation from 2011. Mariette Rousseau Vermette, a member of the Royal Canadian Academy of Arts and an Order of Canada officer, created such a community when she headed the Fibers program at the Banff Center for Arts and Creativity from 1979 to 1985. Artists she had met at the Lausanne Biennale in Switzerland, including Zofia Butramowitz, were part of her fiber exchange initiative. Leah Cook, Warren Selig, Daniel Grafen of France, Jagoda Buick of Croatia, Claire Zeisler, and author and former MoMA textile curator, Mildred Constantine, were all attendees. This work, Bohemian Waxwing, was done in that period, 1984. In her acclaim essay, Carolyn Kipp offers another explanation for why someone would give their attention and time to an occupation or activity day after day, year after year, even without receiving much recognition. She suggests that these artists have realized that it's possible to turn a difficult task into a fulfilling one by engaging in the act of what researchers call serious play. Researchers have explored the concept, which involves sustained focus and often results in a feeling of flow, a mental emotional state where participants lose track of time, cease to be self-critical, and are fully immersed in their task. Reaching that state makes the activity intrinsically rewarding. An example Kip points to is the intellectual and visual play expressed in Trompe Loyal, found in work by Leah Cook, Gerhard Nodell, Greta Sorensen, and Helena Hanmark. Here, Leah Cook's works from 1978 and 1977. Kip also sees the interest in the technology of textiles and the exploration of grid of warp and weft formed on the loom as a starting point for serious play. Gold medalist James Bassler's Andean-inspired wall hangings are an example. Bassler created this for salvaged work this year at age 90. He was reading the review of a book at a time, Last Light, How Six Great Artists Made Old Age a Time of Triumph, and borrowed a title from Francesco de Goya, Un Aprendo, I Am Still Learning. Kip considered Dominic Demar's suspended weavings from the 1960s as another example. They are quite a contrast from the meticulous assemblages he began creating in the 1980s. For a sense of literal playfulness, it's hard to ignore Genesis by Jane Sauer from 2001. Arena Kolnoskova's alter ego is another example. He often appears in her works. He is a slightly comic, clumsy human in an uncertain age who is just a survivor and struggles to keep his existence balanced. His search for balance reflects life in Russia as Kolnoskova experienced it before immigrating to Germany. The traditional credo of life in Russia, she says, is to survive, to hide, to find a sphere of activity in which you can do what is interesting for you. The main thing is that the official authoritarian ideology could not penetrate there. Devoting yourself to your work when you feel you have to hide your passion clearly requires a motivation beyond recognition. That has changed for Kolnistakova since she has been awarded a first and grand prize at European competitions since leaving Russia. Kip calls out Catherine Westfall as the grand dame of play-focused experimentation. Visually and conceptually, Westfall embraced a distinct schism with high modernist aesthetics by including collage, embellishment, non-art materials, and experimental methods like Xerox transfers in her work. In Mir from 1997, the mix of signs and symbols show both her dedication to serious play and her enthusiastic, playful character. Kip sees Westfall's decades of work as representing an important transition between modernism and postmodernism that was largely othered by mainstream art circles, in part because it was hard to categorize. She was also, Kip argues, well ahead of others in the textile field in rebelling against the tight constraints of formalism. I urge you to read all of Kip's essay in the Acclaim catalog. It's available on our website.
that ends our whirlwind presentation. Thank you for joining our third Art on the Rocks exhibition, Talk Through with Spirits. See all the pieces in the exhibition online on Artsy and in the catalog. Thanks again to Max at Eat, Cook, Run, Sleep, Repeat, and to our team at Juice Creative, Wilson Beltran, Haley Springer, Mary Luke, Mike Kelleher, and Peter Fisher, who have provided technical and email assistance. To everyone else, we thank you for attending. Cheers.